What I'd like to talk about first is just how remote sensing actually works. Okay, so I've got a nice little animation here which is basically just giving us the indication that sunlight comes in, it interacts in some way with the surface of the earth, the atmosphere, the water, and then goes back up to a satellite or sensor for it to obtain that information. What you see on, the, on your right hand side of the screen there are two Landsat images. All right, we'll look at Landsat this afternoon in the practical and we'll talk about it a lot throughout the semester. Okay, so a few cool things about Landsat and this is one of the reasons that we use it quite a lot throughout the semester. Number one is it's a free archive. So it's, it's been free for the past or oh, 10 years or so and there's a massive archive of data that's run through the United States Geological Survey and so we can access all that data for free. It comes over every 16 days to take an image of any particular area. It's a multi-spectral imager, okay? So it looks at a range of different wavelengths across the visible and non-visible spectrum. Okay, so you can see some of that up the top and then down the bottom, you can see a thermal image. Okay, so thermal is showing us temperature. So anywhere where you see the colours are brighter, that means it's warmer on the surface of the earth or water there as well. Yeah? And it, so that thermal sensor is available on Landsat as well. Okay, so we get a nice range of visible and non-visible as well as that thermal data too on, Landsat, on, on the Landsat system. Okay, so we will talk about that a whole lot more throughout the semester. But just, a, just as a brief introduction, this is what we're working with, the electromagnetic radiation from the sun, bouncing off or interacting with the atmosphere, the earth, the water, and then coming back up to a sensor to record that information. All right, so why do we actually want to know this? Why, why do we need to know anything about electromagnetic radiation? It provides us a means to interpret our information as long as we know what those wavelengths actually mean with respect to the surface that we're looking at. Yeah? Okay, so if, if I know that green light interacts in a particular manner with, say, vegetation, then I can start to figure out what it is about that vegetation that I'm seeing through my satellite data. Okay? And the same goes for near infrared light. So what you guys will learn throughout the semester is that vegetation is highly sensitive to near infrared light and it provides us a lot of information. Okay? And once we understand those interactions, then when we look at our imagery, we can interpret that a lot easier. So this then allows us to identify features on the surface of the earth. Okay? So to look at an image and say, yeah, okay, I know that that's a forested area. But then if we get a little bit more into the interactions of light, not only do we have to say, yeah, that's a forested area, but we might be able to say something about the health of that forest or the biomass, okay? So we know that that, that is a, a really dense, healthy forest. Or actually, that forest is kind of dying off, yeah? Okay, so this is all about understanding the electromagnetic radiation interactions with the features on the Earth. Okay, I do have to go through some theory, all right? Now, what I want you to take away from the basic physics theory here is the main outcome of what I'm going to discuss, okay? So I'll highlight these parts in yellow. All right, so the first thing that we go through is wave and particle theory with respect to electromagnetic radiation. Okay, so you guys watch the video before class. Can you tell me what the particles of light are called? Photons. Photons, yeah, okay. And so we know that electromagnetic radiation travels in waves, yeah? Okay, so we've got waves that are comprised of photons essentially, yeah? Okay, and all waves travel at the speed of light, yeah? Okay, so blue light travels at the same speed as gamma rays. Yeah, same speed? Definitely? Am I right? Yes? Good. All right, so it doesn't matter what the wavelength is, they're all at the same speed. Linda? So we've got the speed of, um, the speed of light as a C, all right? And this is always a constant. You don't need to know what that value is. You can always Google it if you need to know, but you don't need to memorize it or anything. Um, we've got the frequency of the wavelength being V, 
Okay, so how many times it bounces up and down is our frequency. And the wavelength. Okay, so this character here, lambda, representing wavelength, you do need to know. Okay, we use this a lot throughout the semester. Okay, so anytime you see this character here, it means wavelength. Okay, so the, the speed of light is equal to the frequency times the wavelength. Yeah? So all that this means, and this is the main take home from this slide here, is that because C is constant, yeah, it's a value that does not change, if V or the frequency increases, therefore the wavelength must decrease. Yeah? So if this stays the same, if one goes up, then the other has to go down. Okay, so moving on from there, we have a, a brief look at the regions of the electromagnetic spectrum. Okay, so going all the way down, or all the way up from cosmic rays, all the way through to microwaves and beyond, we've got a tiny little portion here, which is the visible region of the electromagnetic spectrum, which is what we can see. Really small portion, yeah? Not much at all. So, when we're looking at Earth observation remote sensing, we use the visible, but again, just a little bit. Um, and then we move also into the near infrared, the mid infrared, and up to the thermal infrared or our temperature range. Okay, so around about here is, is our main portion of the energy that we use for looking at satellite data. Okay, so to recap on the last slide, if we have short wavelengths, do we have high or low frequency? Okay, hands up for high, hands up for low, anyone uncertain? Okay, short wavelength, high frequency, okay, inversely related. Okay, so therefore if we have long wavelength, high or low frequency? Low frequency, yeah? Short wavelength, high frequency, long wavelength, low frequency. So that's looking at waves of light. Now we need to look a little bit at the particles, all right? Another equation. Again, you don't need to know the equation off by heart, but I want you to understand what we, what we do with it. Okay, so Q equals HV, relatively simple equation. Okay, so here's our energy for Q. H is a constant, okay, so it doesn't change. And what was V, can you remember? Frequency, yeah, from the last slide. So what we just said before was the speed of light is equal to the frequency times times the wavelength, yeah? Okay, and if we want to rearrange that, we could also say the frequency is equal to the speed of light divided by the wavelength, yeah? Okay, just switching things around. So now what I want to do is to actually take this into here. Okay, so we see our V up here and here, and now I'm going to take my speed of light and my wavelength into this equation. Yeah? Okay, so the outcome of that is my energy is equal to a constant times another constant divided by the wavelength. So H and C are constants, yeah, so we pretty much forget them which means that the energy is therefore inversely proportional to the wavelength, okay? So short wavelength, high energy, vice versa, yeah? Okay, so can anyone tell me which has a longer wavelength, blue or red light? Red light is longer wavelength than blue, yeah? Okay, so which has higher energy? Blue wavelength, higher energy, yeah? Okay, so tell me how are you feeling today? Are you feeling blue? Anybody? Anyone want to say that they're blue? Which remember now is actually high energy. Yeah? Anyone feeling blue? Really? You're feeling just one, two. Okay, everyone stand up. Let's go. Up, up, up. <laughs> Standing up. Okay, five star jumps. Let's go. Come on. Everybody needs to do it, yeah? Okay, take a seat. Who's feeling blue? Do I have some more blues? Please don't make me go to burpees. That's not fun, yeah? Okay, 
Anyone who's a red? Do you dare say you're red? <laughs> really? <laughs> okay. So remember, short wavelength, high energy. Yeah, and if you're not feeling it, let's get up and do some star jumps. Yeah? Okay. So having a look at a graph for this relationship. Okay. On the x-axis, we have wavelength, and there's that character lambda again. Yeah? Okay, so you're going to see this quite frequently throughout the semester. X-axis wavelength against a range of different things. Um, and the y-axis is that energy or that Q. Okay, so really simply plotted. Okay, increase the wavelength, decrease the energy. Yeah? All right, what does this mean for us? Okay, so all well and good. You understand this relationship now, but what does that mean in Earth observation remote sensing? Okay, so two images for you, okay, both from the Landsat sensor, okay, taken at the exact same time, but the one on the left is using mid infrared or shortwave infrared radiation, and the one on the right is using thermal infrared or temperature, okay. So visually, what's the difference between the two? Yeah, okay, so which one's sharper? The one on the left, okay. So between the mid-infrared or the shortwave infrared and the thermal infrared or our temperature, which has the longer wavelength? Thermal infrared is longer wavelength, okay. So what does wavelength mean in terms of energy? Long wavelength, long wavelength, low energy, yeah? Okay, so here we've got low energy and here we've got higher energy, okay? So on the ground, what this actually means is that the satellite needs to acquire energy from the ground, all right? And usually this means that it's sunlight down to the ground, bouncing back up to the sensor, okay? Now when it, when it takes an image, it looks at a set area, all right? And it's got a certain period of time that, it, that it's able to do this. Now, if there's not a lot of energy coming back up at the sensor, it actually needs to look at a larger area to get the information that it needs. Okay? So, we've got our higher energy here, which means that the satellite can then look at relatively small areas. Okay? So, in this image, if you zoomed in all the way, you'd be able to see individual pixels. Yeah? And for this one, we have a pixel size of 30 metres by 30 metres. Okay, but because the thermal imagery is of a lot lower energy, the satellite needs to get that energy from a larger area to get enough information. Okay, so where we have 30 metres here, we need to have 90 metres here. And so the effect of that that we see is that we can see a lot more detail around Darwin here, but not so much there. Yeah, does that make sense? Okay, so that's why I get you to go through the physics of understanding exactly what this actually means because it does have implications for us. Okay, so just a little bit more in terms of terminology. Okay, there's a lot of terminology in remote sensing, but I'm going to try and highlight some of the key things that you need to know. All right, so the first thing is we look at energy. All right, so which we've already touched on when, when I just showed you that equation of Q equals H and V, yeah? So we look at joules and watts, okay? And we don't go into that in a lot of detail in the class, okay? What we will talk a lot more about is the amount of energy received at the sensor as it's come back off the ground, okay? And the main thing that we'll discuss is radiance. Okay, so we look a little at irradiance, not so much, but mostly radiance, okay, which is the amount of light coming off. So we measure radiance in terms of a solid angle, all right, in that it's the amount of light coming off the ground in, in an angle up to a sensor, yeah, okay. So I said radiance and irradiance. The difference between the two of those is that irradiance looks at all angles. Okay, so if you imagine a tennis ball that you hold in your hand 
and light can strike it from any which direction, yeah? Okay, so that would be measuring irradiance. Okay, whereas when we look at our eyes, we have an angle that we can see out to, yeah? And depends on how good your peripheral vision is, but you don't see stuff behind you. So that angle that we're looking out at is capturing light, which is radiance, yeah? Okay, so the difference between the two terms is just that angular term. Yeah, make sense? Okay, one more equation for you guys. All right, this is all about how energy relates to temperature and then how we can see that. All right, so we've got an M here, which is essentially energy, a constant, and the temperature. Okay, so the main fact and this particular equation is that it's temperature to the power of four, yeah? So when we're looking at this, the effect of this equation means that any energy coming out increases very quickly with increases in temperature, yeah? So for every degree that you go up, that am the amount of energy is going to go up to the power of four. Yeah? What does this actually mean for us? Okay, so again, we've got wavelength on the x-axis of this, of this graph, okay? And we've got, we've got that energy on the y-axis, yeah? Now, what you can see with each of these curves is that as, as these temperature well, these are, sorry, these are temperature curves. And as the temperature increases, so these peaks get higher and higher, they start shifting to shorter wavelengths. Yeah, can you see that? So this one is at 200 Kelvin. Okay, so to convert from Kelvin to Celsius, it's minus 273 degrees. So at 200 Kelvin, we've got this little peak that's sitting um, at around about uh, 15 micrometers or so. At 300 Kelvin, it starts shifting this way until we get to 6,000 Kelvin, which is in this particular range here, okay? Which, which happens to be our visible range. That's where we can see, all right? So as temperature increases, we see a shift in wavelength to the left, to shorter sides, okay? Now, what this actually means practically is that as something becomes hotter and hotter, you can start to measure it at shorter and shorter wavelengths. All right, anyone who's done chemistry here? Yeah? Yeah, most people have done chemistry. Have you ever used a Bunsen burner? Yeah, what color is the safety flame? <laughs> what color is the safety flame? Who's gonna get burnt here? Yellow for the safety flame, yeah? Yeah, the nice big one, and the, and the flame that you might use to really cook something is blue. Okay, which is the shorter wavelength? Blue, yeah? Okay, so as, as we get to shorter wavelengths, sorry, as we get to higher temperatures, we start to be able to see it in shorter wavelengths. All right, application for this. If you have a relatively mild fire, you usually cannot see it in visible satellite imagery. You have to use the thermal bands to measure the temperature, yeah? As that fire becomes hotter and hotter, you'll be able to see it in shorter and shorter wavelengths, okay? And we're gonna have a look at this this afternoon as well. And here's a good little diagram just down the bottom here that also that links with this little picture, okay? So which is the hottest part? of this metal, right down the bottom, yeah, okay. So that's, that's really getting into white light, which is a combination of all colors of light, yeah? And the cooler parts are the more reds, which is a little bit counterintuitive, considering we say blue is a cool color and, and red is a warm color, yeah? Okay, so a recap for you guys. As wavelengths decrease, the frequency increases, and the energy increases, okay? So inverse, inverse relationship there. Our emitted energy increases very quickly 
with increases in temperature. Okay, that was the t to the power of four. Um, and with a temperature increase, that wavelength of maximum energy that we can actually see decreases.